Well, Happy New Year. It's been three days, and that's what I get, three days now. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. That's better. That's better. I want to talk today about something that will help you have a more happy New Year, and it will also, if you really pay attention, if you hear what God's Word has to say, and if you respond by living it out, uh, it will help everyone around you, every person in your life, have a more happy New Year, a better, healthier New Year. And it has to do with this. has to do with your tongue. I want to talk a little bit about the tongue. Do you know that the blue whale has a tongue that's heavier than an elephant? 2.6 metric tons. You have between 3,000 and 10,000 taste buds on your tongue. And all of them wear off in normally in about two weeks. And then they are, your body restores them. Isn't that amazing? And as you get older, not as many are restored. So if you want to taste something delicious, do it when you're young. Because you start losing some of that, that, that taste. Now, I want to I do, do a little tongue test, all right? I want everyone to be involved in this. You can get five points, and we're going to have winners at the end, no prizes, except that we'll applaud for you and tell you you're wonderful. Uh, but five, five questions, and see if, if you can do these things with your tongue. Here's the first thing, all right? You get one point if you can do this. Look at the person next to you. Show them if you can do it. Some people can't. Not, not your, not your, okay, good. So how many have a point? Okay, good. Number two. A point for this. Without spitting on anybody, without spitting on the person next to you, show them. Okay, who's got two points now? Who's still in? Okay. Here's the third one. If you can roll your tongue like this. Stop popping over there. Now we're rolling, okay? Show the person next to you. Okay, who has three points? All right, okay, okay. Now here's the tough one. If you can take your tongue and turn it over. I can't. If you can show the person next to you. How many people have four points? Okay, and those people that can turn their tongue over, they're so proud of themselves, aren't they? But now, one more, one more. If you can take your tongue and turn it over this way and then turn it over the other way too, both ways. Show your neighbor if you can do that. And we get five points. All right, we're all very proud of you. Can we give them a hand? You're, you're amazing, you're gifted. Now, if you got five points, you have to listen to this sermon even better. Because you have a very powerful tongue. <laughs> and I want to talk about today, uh, every year, I make sure sometime in the year, I talk about the power of our words. Every year, because they are so powerful, because the Bible talks a lot about this. And today we're going to talk about two different themes in terms of our words. The first one is this, that words have the power of life and death. That words have the power of life and death. In James chapter 3, verse 6, we read this. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Well, James, tell us what you think, right? Um, wow. It says the tongue also is a fire. The idea is that your tongue, my tongue, burns. It can. It has potential for this. You know, so that's no big deal. It's just a little flame. Drop that in some dry grass around a wooded area and tell me that's just a flame. So that's just a little flame. Watch that flame get, get the, get the uh, curtains by your, by your stove or in your kitchen and watch the flames go up there and say, oh, that's not just a little flame. There's power there. And what the Bible say, is saying is that our words have power to burn. And you know it's true. Because some of the most burning, painful moments in your life have been when somebody has said something to you that was harsh and painful, or when somebody said something about you and you weren't there and you found out what they said. Every one of us bears some of the scars and the burns of the words of others. And you know your words can burn because you've had those moments where you've spoken something to someone else. And after you said those words, you realized they burned more than you thought they would. You might have been angry, you might have been frustrated, but boy, when you looked at their face and you saw what you said and you, see how, you saw how it burned them, you thought, what did I just do? Do you know what I'm talking about? That moment where you say something and you think, what did I just do? James says, your words are like a fire. Proverbs in the Old Testament, chapter 12, verse 18 says this. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. The words of the reckless pierce like swords. Uh, this is a real sword. 
Uh, it, it glows if orcs are near. Uh, if, a little sub-reference if you know what that means. But uh, uh, this sword is very sharp. On the sides, you could cut yourself, and the tip is very sharp. And what James is saying is, there are words, and you know this is true because you've had that moment where somebody has said something to you into your face. They've been, for whatever, they were mad, they were frustrated, and they spoke something, and you felt it was just like those words just went in like a knife, like a sword into your soul and into your gut, into your emotional life because that person matters to you, and they spoke harsh words. You know what it was like because there was a point where you said something to somebody, you were so frustrated, they had made you so mad, they had said something about you, or you heard what they said about you, and you wanted to get back, and so you just... You let them have it. You've done that, and you've had it done to you. And, and Proverbs says, your words can be like sword thrusts. You want to have a good new year? Remember this. Your words can burn. Your words can cut and slash and hurt. And I know that moment, and you know that moment where somebody has said something or done something, and you're so frustrated, and you just, and you want to let them, they need a piece of your mind, they need to know what you're thinking, they deserve it, but it's true, and you're mad, and you just let them have it. And you see their face, and you realize, that's my five-year-old daughter. I just stabbed with my words. That's my 16-year-old son. I just burned with my words. That's my wife. I just cut to the ground with my words. It's my colleague at work, whoever it is. We've been there. We know this, but we have to remember it as we walk into a new year. And then Proverbs says this in Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The tongue also has the power of life. There is power in your words, not just to cut, not just to burn, but to bring life. And so what is the pastor carrying around right here? Uh, this says on the front, it says life pack. This is a life pack. It's, it's owned by Shoreline Church. We've got a couple of these around here. This is one of the tools of the CERT team. You all know what the CERT team is, right? Do you know how many ministries are going on around here you don't even know about? <laughs> the CERT team is the Shoreline Emergency Response Team. There's members of the CERT team in every service sitting right up there, they have reserved seats that say CERT. It's not a misspelling of seat. It's CERT. All right? Somebody, somebody put, that on, put, the, put that online. Look at this. Miss, it, said, it said reserved CERT. And somebody put it online saying, oh, look at this. They misspelled. No, it's reserved for the Shoreline Emergency Response Team. You know who these people are? These are nurses and doctors and firefighters and people in the police professions who are part of this church, who every service are sitting right there to make sure if anything happens and there's a need, they're ready to serve you. Isn't that great? And this right here, this is a power-packed defibrillator. So if somebody during a service were to go into cardiac arrest, we hope they don't have to use this, but if, they, if there was a need, they're there. And they could bring this thing and do that. I've only seen it like in movies and TV. You know, you know, boom, clear, boom, and shock and bring the heart back again. I love what the Word of God says in Proverbs. Your words have the power of life. You walk around people every day who look fine on the outside, but they're dying on the inside. They're emotionally struggling, hurting, feeling dead on the inside, relationally hurt and in pain, struggling. And, and do you know that the words you bring, the words you speak, could be like those paddles that just go boom and bring life? God has given you so much power in the things you say, and we forget that our words can burn and our words can cut, but our words can bring life. And God has given you that little pink part of your body with 3,000 to 10,000 taste buds to do more than just enjoy things that taste good. He's given you a mouth and a tongue that can be guided by a heart that loves God and a mind that thinks well and stops and thinks before you speak. So today I want to think about this reality. Here's a word about our words. We should be honest about their power and make a decision to be a person who brings life, healing, and blessing with words. I hope today, you want to have a great new year, you make a decision today that your words will not cut, will not burn, but more and more, your words will bring life and blessing. Can I tell you, the last couple of weeks that I've been preparing this sermon, God has been convicting me, speaking to me. I am growing in this area. And I've noticed different times the last couple weeks where I'm like, whoa, right there, be careful, Kevin. My mouth can go. You know, my mouth, I can say things I shouldn't. 
And God's been speaking to me and challenging me. You want to have a great new year. You become a person who brings life and blessing and healing and hope with your words. And your year and the, years of those, the year of those people around you, it will be changed by the power and the life that comes through words. I want to think about words for the new year and a way of blessing, making a decision to be somebody who blesses. I want to give you four affirmations. If you're a note taker, you'll notice in your bulletin, uh, there's actually a place to write notes down. There's a place to fill in some blanks. There's four affirmations that are mostly filled out there. If you're a note taker, write these things down. If not, just kind of get them in your mind. I'm going to ask you with each of these affirmations, if you're willing to, those that are willing, I'm going to read it once, and I'm going to ask you to read it with me and declare this to get it in your mind and your heart. Here's the first affirmation. I will see people through the eyes of Jesus. Let's say that together. I will see people through the eyes of Jesus. Lord Jesus, help me see people the way you see them. So somebody cuts me off in traffic and races around me. My first thought is not, what a jerk, what's wrong with them? Maybe I'll race up and have a conversation with them. Uh, that, 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 that your first thought is, God, that's someone you love who drives really fast and dangerously. And that's, and God, that's someone you care about. Jesus, that's somebody you died for. So, so, so you're in a restaurant and, and somebody doesn't give you great service. Your first th thought is not, what, how can I dock them in their pay? How can I complain? How can I tell them what's wrong? Your first thought is, I hope they're doing okay. My wife and I are so dramatically different. When we first started dating, you know, if we went out, we'd go out to eat, and be, you know, we'd go out to eat, and if we got bad service, I'd go, oh, you shouldn't tip them, and you should, you, know, you should, you know, don't reinforce bad behavior. And I'm, and and my wife is thinking, I bet they've had a hard week. Maybe they lost someone in their life that they love, and her heart's like, she's thinking about what they might need, and I'm thinking about what's wrong with them, you know. <laughs> um, so we're slightly different. Now I'm not like that any at all anymore. I've grown so much, I, and I actually have grown a lot by by our relationship. But you know, how do you respond to, to, to say, God, I want to see people through the eyes of Jesus? So there's people who've hurt you, who've wronged you, who've done things that make you frustrated, that make you want to lash out with your words. But you say, but God, <clears throat> could I see them the way you see them? You know how God sees people who don't yet know Jesus? Like sheep without a shepherd, wandering. You know how God sees people who know Jesus? Like sheep who have a shepherd, but who still need a lot of help, right? God, help me start to see people the way you see them. Because here's the thing, your words aren't going to change till your heart and your mind change until you care about people, until you think differently. It's not like you just go, okay, I'm going to change my words. And some of you try, I'm just I'm not going to say that anymore, and it comes out. You know, the, the reason is your heart hasn't changed and your mind hasn't changed. So Lord, let me see people the way you see them. Let me love people the way you love them. Let me think in a different way. Declaration number two. I will notice and focus on what is good and worthy of blessing. Let's say that together. I will notice and focus on what is good and worthy of blessing. Do you realize that in every relationship you have, Every relationship, if you look close enough, if you study the person enough, you can find something to complain about. You can find something wrong. You can find some deficit in there. And everyone you know, it doesn't matter how nice they are, if you look close enough, you can find something to criticize and put down if you try. You know why? Because they're human beings and we're imperfect. But you also realize that every person you meet and know, if you look close enough, and if you really pay attention, there are things you can bless and encourage, and build up, and celebrate. Will you be a person this year that looks for those things to bless, This decides you're going to encourage and build up the people that God's put in your life? Now, I'm not saying that we don't deal with the tough stuff, and I'm going to talk about that in the message, and also more in this, this year. We're gonna, I'm going to give you skills for how to deal with those tough things where you have to address a challenge. But I'm saying our disposition and starting point should be that of blessing and encouraging. There's enough cursing and tearing down and bad stuff in the world. Let's be people filled with God's Holy Spirit. If you know Jesus, his spirit dwells in you. Let's be people who bless. Statement number three, declaration number three. I will speak words of life and healing every day. Let's say that together. I will speak words of life and healing every day. Make a decision. I want to ask you to think of three people right now in three different locations that you will make a commitment as often, daily or as often as you can in the coming year to bring a word of blessing. So one person in your home, think of one person in your home, one person in the church, whether you're part of showing or another church, if you're part of a church, one person in that church, and then one person in your vocational world. So if your vocation is school, if you're a student, or if your vocation is a job, or if your vocation is volunteering in the community, wherever you're investing your time, you know, work, school, volunteer settings. So one person in your home, one person in your church, and one person in your vocational life. And actually write a name down or in your mind, say, God, who's a person? And then make a decision 
on a daily basis or as often as you can to bring a word of blessing to that person. Now, a couple thoughts. If you're talking about your home and you live alone, here's the good part. You get to bless yourself every day. So make a commitment every day, if you're, on, if you're living on your own, where you will be, and I really meant to say, to look at yourself, be creative, be kind to yourself. Say something that blesses yourself every day. Notice what's good in you and thank God for that. If you're married and you're an empty nester, and it's just the two of you, don't pick yourself to bless every day. Okay? Choose your spouse, all right? That was just, just a little advice. You know, hey, Sherry, I decided and prayed about it. I'm going to bless me every day this year. It's going to be her. We're empty nesters. She's the only other one in the house. So, so every day, it could be one of your, a son or daughter. It could be a brother, your brother or sister that you live with. It could be a roommate. But make a commitment every day or as often as you can to bring a word of blessing. And so, so in your home, in the church, and in your vocational world, I will speak words of life and healing every day. And number four, I will evaluate my words and grow in my ability to bless. Let's declare that together. I will evaluate my words and grow in my ability to bless. I want to challenge you to, to think about what you're going to say. You want to have a good 2015? You want to have a happy new year? You want the people around you to have a happy new year? Start to evaluate your words. You're about to say something. You think to yourself, that's not going to bless. That's not going to build up. That's not going to encourage. That's going to hurt. Boy, I, gotta, I, I don't want to. How can I say it in a way that's kinder? I mean, to, to really slow down, to evaluate what you're saying, to say, God, give me a heart like Jesus. Let me see people the way Jesus does. God, help me learn to be one who blesses and make decisions to bless. You know what's going to happen? If you, if you on a daily basis or a regular basis begin to bless those three people, one in your home, one in the church, one in your vocational world, and you start doing that regularly, it will be, become part of your lifestyle. And you'll start to do that for other people as well. Good habits create good habits. Bad habits create bad habits. Start this process. And, here, and here's the thing about words of blessing. How many of you just love being around people whose words burn you and cut you and put you down? Anybody just, I mean, you just look for people like that. You just, it's just so much fun. It's, you know, that's, we're not, we kind of naturally kind of pull away from that. But how many of you are drawn to people who bless, who encourage, who speak life and grace I mean, how many, aren't you just drawn to that? Don't you just love to be around people like that? You want to have a happy new year? Become that kind of person. And it begins by saying, God, let my mind and heart be like yours. Let them be changed so that my words can reflect your words. It, it means you just, you just walk through these realities. Notice when something good is happening and bless that, encourage that. Speak words of life and healing every day and evaluate your words. And, and I'll tell you, the last couple of weeks, I've caught myself on a number of occasions and I've stopped. Because I found I'm not, saying, it's not, I'm not saying the right thing. I'm not saying it the right way. And on some occasions, I've noticed it. And I thought, well, let me just finish my thought here. <laughs> and, and afterwards, I thought, that was just not right. I'm learning. I'm growing. But I want to be that person who notices and sees and who blesses. And so I want to encourage you to, to really think about that, to really pray. But that's the first lesson. There, there is life and death in the power of your words. Fire can burn. A knife can cut. So can the tongue. But life exists in your words. You can bring life and breathe life into other people through the things you say. What if they don't reciprocate and say nice things to you? That's not your issue. Your call is to bless and to speak words of life and let God take it from there. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two about our words. Words number two. Grumbling and whining is sin and a very bad one. You won't hear this in a lot of churches. As a matter of fact, some churches, grumbling and complaining is sort of a, is sort of a church pastime. And, uh, oh, that's just what she's like. That's just what she's like. They're always complaining. And we just, oh, that's just them. No, it's sin. It's sin. It really is. And I actually, every year for my entire, probably my third or fourth year of ministries, for almost, going towards almost 30 years now, every year, wherever, I, wherever I've been as a lead pastor, I preach every year on the power of our words and particularly the sin of grumbling. Why? because it comes up again and again and again in our churches, in our homes, in our families, in our workplaces. Grumbling, complaining, and whining is a national pastime. And it is, it is so important in our culture that there's entire TV shows devoted to it where all you get is whining, grumbling, complaining about how bad everything is. And you can pick out what those, those shows are, but it's just it's part of our culture. And we can become like that if we're not careful. Now, why do I say that grumbling and whining is a sin and a very bad one? Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul is, is looking back in the history of Israel. He's looking back. Israel had been captives in Egypt. They prayed to God. God sent a deliverer in Moses. They left Egypt. They were set free by the mighty hand of God. They crossed the Red Sea. They were going to go through the desert and right into the promised land. But while they were in the desert, they lacked faith. They didn't believe that God could actually bring them in. And they basically chose to not follow God into his promise. So for years, they wandered in the wilderness waiting till a whole generation passed away and a new generation went into the land. But while they wandered in the desert, there were four primary sins that they committed over and over and over again. And, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, what the Apostle Paul is doing is he's pointing back to that time in the history of Israel. And he's saying, listen, remember what things were like back then. Remember how they sinned over and over. And he said, don't be like that. Look at their bad example and make sure that you're not like that bad example. With that in mind, look with me at 1 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse 6. It says, now these things occurred, meaning all their sins in the past, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on, e on the evil things as they did. See, he says, these things are recorded and we can remember them so we don't do that. So then he lists the four really big sins of the people of Israel. Watch these four sins. Number one, verse seven. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written that people sat down to eat and drink and they got up to indulge in revelry. They made this golden calf. They bowed down to worship. They had a big party. They turned their hearts from God. Idols are anything we worship that isn't God. Anything we devote ourselves to that isn't God. And he says, don't commit idolatry. A big sin then, a big sin now. Don't do that. Verse 8. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. There was even consequences for their sins in the desert. Don't commit sexual immorality. God's given this beautiful gift of sexuality, male, female. And God has said, listen, I've made you. I made you good. And if you're in that covenant of marriage with a man and a woman, God says, it is good. It is very good. Express yourself. But outside of that, he says, that's, that's sin. So follow me in this aspect of your life. If you don't, that's sin. So idolatry, immorality. Verse 9, we should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. You know, this is severe. Well, it was severe sins. They were testing God. They weren't trusting in God. They were testing him. They did this over and over. There was consequences. Idolatry, immorality, testing God. Verse 10, and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. You go, grumble, complain. I mean, you know, we're talking about idolatry, sexual immorality, testing God. Why throw grumbling in there? That hardly qualifies. Yes, it does. As a matter of fact, if you read the desert wanderings of the, the people of Israel, their most consistent sin was grumbling. And it brought severe judgment. Well, why then do we in the church today act like it's no big deal? Why do we not inspect our own hearts and make sure we don't grumble? It's a big sin. We should be concerned about it. It shouldn't happen in the church, in our homes, in culture. And Christians should not be grumblers. So here's the four big sins during Israel's desert wanderings. Idolatry, sexual immorality, testing God, and grumbling. And those are the big sins. And grumbling is as big or in some ways probably worse than some of the others, the way it impacted the people of Israel. So some people say, well, wait a minute, wait now. I, I know we're not supposed to be grumblers, but, but we are supposed to speak the truth in love. I mean, if somebody does something wrong, we should let them know. And, I, I, and my gift, I speak the truth in love every chance I get. I mean, that's my calling. And I just let people know what they're doing wrong for Jesus. Because that's what I do. You know, and, I'm, and I'm good at it. I've refined my skills. Um, you know, I say, okay, shouldn't we speak the truth in love? The answer is yes. So what's the difference between speaking the truth in love and grumbling and complaining? And that's what I want to talk about. What's the difference between speaking the truth in love and grumbling? And here's the four differences. Number one, Timing. Number two, the person. Number three, my attitude. And number four, my goal. Those four things make all the difference in the world. Let me walk you through these. The timing. Speaking the truth in love. <clears throat> Somebody's wronged you. They've done something that's really inappropriate. They've gotten involved in a behavior, a sin, and you want to address it. Speaking the truth in love is finding the right time to talk to them. It's finding the right time. Have you ever known? There, there's times that are the right time and times that are the wrong time for about everything in life. So you say, Lord, what's the right timing to sit and talk with this person? Because I care about them. 
and you find the right time. Whereas grumbling and complaining is all the time. It's just spewing and letting, oh man, I'm upset. I don't like this person. That person bothered me and this person really upset me and, and I don't like this and I don't like that and the pastor this and my boss that and, blah, 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 and it's just all the time. Speaking the truth in love is saying, what's the right timing to sit and have a conversation? And grumbling and complaining is just spewing poison and relational venom wherever you go. That's the difference. Which are you doing? Number two, the person. Speaking the truth in love is following what Jesus taught in Matthew 18, 15 to 17. In Matthew 18, 15 to 7, 17, Jesus says, if your brother or sister wrongs you, if they sin against you, first thing he says is this, go between you and them alone. Just the two of you. So who else are you talking to about it? Nobody else. Then if that doesn't become restored, he says, then you bring a couple other people in. There's a whole process that's very discreet, that's very grace-filled, and it's just meant to restore. So who do you go to if, somebody, if you have a concern with somebody? You go between you and that person. That's speaking the truth in love. Grumbling, you go to everybody but that person. And you talk about them. Well, I don't really like that person. I don't really like that pastor. I don't really like that board member. I don't really like that Sunday school teacher. Well, that person, my, my boss did this. My per, and, and you're just, and you're, so here's the difference. Speaking the truth in love, you are talking to that person. It's a face-to-face -face encounter. Grumbling and complaining is you are talking not to that person, but what? About that person. When you find yourself talking about that person and it's not flattering, that's grumbling. That's complaining. That's sin from what the Bible says. You say, well, I didn't see it that way. Now you do. Now you do. The timing of the person. Number three, my attitude. What's your attitude like? When it comes to speaking the truth in love, your attitude is humble, it's grace-filled, it's tender. You can come to somebody, you can go to the right time to the right person and say, let me tell you what's wrong with you. <laughs> oh, that's not the right spirit. There's a gentle spirit. Because you know that if it wasn't for Jesus' grace in your life, you know, you know that you're imperfect. You speak the truth in love, you do it in love. You don't come in judgment, you come for healing. And you come with a tenderness and a humility. Yes, you share the concern. Yes, you're totally honest. Yes, you put it on the table. But you do it with a tenderness of heart. And that can lead to something good and positive. Whereas grumbling and complaining... Uh, the, whole, the, whole, the whole attitude is just, it's venting. It's just pouring out. It's, I'm so frustrated. I'm so sick of that person. I'm so upset. And we can, we can grumble about anything. You know what the people of Israel, one of their primary grumblings was about? They're in the desert. There's nothing to eat. So God does this miracle, and every day he just rains down these flakes, this, this heavenly cereal, this manna. Manna means what is it? They, they, we don't know what is this. What is it? Manna, manna, what is it? Well, let's call it manna because we don't know what it is. But it's cereal from heaven, and it, the Bible actually says, and it was sweet as honey. So I mean, every day God does a miracle, every day, except for, except for the Sabbath day. They had to get enough for two days a day before, but, but every day except for the Sabbath day. That's, that's another miracle. Manna every day, Sabbath day, no manna. Collect double the week the day before. Interesting story. But here, so all the manna comes down. It tastes sweet as honey. It gives them food to live on in the desert. And they start to complain, we don't like manna. We're sick of manna. It's, we're tired of manna. We're tired of the heavenly gift that God gives us every day. And they're complaining at this point against God. And they're venting. And we can be like that. God can give us good gifts. We can focus on what we don't like, and we can just vent. So, so, so there's, there's a whole different attitude. And then the goal. Speaking the truth in love, the goal is healing, restoration, and wholeness. You go to the, at the right time to the right person with the right spirit. And you say, man, this hurt me. That really bothered me. I don't understand this. And you talk it through because you want things to be right. You want things to be healed. You want to have a better relationship. Whereas grumbling and complaining is just to poison, to condemn, to make other people not like them too, just like you don't like them. So be careful. I mean, if you're saying, well, I'm just letting everyone know about what I'm upset about, because that doesn't redeem or help or heal anything. It just makes other people be poisonous too. And, and I, I got to, I'm watching myself, and I'm seeing, man, I do some of these things. I'm, I just go, man, Lord, I, I don't want to be this way. And I'll catch myself, or sometimes I won't catch myself. And this, I think it's a lifelong battle. But you want to have a good, happy new year. Go after this thing. Say, I will not be a grumbler. I will not be a complainer. So here's words for the new year. The big theme is this, no more grumbling. <clears throat> it's a sin. I don't want to live that way. I don't want to be like that. So I have five declarations 
about grumbling. I want to invite you to make with me. The first one is this. I will find the right time to express my heartfelt concerns. And there's, again, these are in, the, in your notes if you want to write these down. And we'll say this together. Number one, I will find the right time to express heartfelt concerns. Find the right time. You have things that concern you. You found your, if you're honest, you're starting to vent, you're grumbling, you're complaining, you're talking about somebody else and say, God, give me the right time. Find that time. Make that time. Set up for that time so you can have an encounter and walk through this. Number two, I will talk with the right person. With enthusiasm, let's say that together. I will talk with the right person. When you find yourself saying, well, they did this, they did that, he did this, she did that, you're talking about them, stop. I'm not talking to the right, just say, I gotta talk to the right person. And if I'm not gonna talk to the right person, I gotta, I gotta stop talking. But say, God, I wanna commit myself. If I have a concern with someone, somebody I gotta work to, I'm gonna find the right person. I am gonna talk with him. I'm gonna talk with her. I'm gonna talk with them, whoever it is, and talk with the right person. Some of you say, I could never do that. Well, then make sure you're not doing that. If you can't do this and make it right, be really sure you can't do that. Well, I can't really talk about it. You're talking to everybody else? Well, I guess I can talk about it. Uh, but... <laughs> But you shouldldn't be. You should be talking with the right I'm going to do it at the right time. I'm going to talk with the right person. Affirmation number three: I will share when my attitude is grace-filled. Let's declare that together. I will share when my attitude is grace-filled. If you find yourself, get, you, know, you want to talk with this person, you want to find the time, you, want, you know who the right person is, but you say, right now, if I talk with them, I'm going to blast them. I mean, I'm just going to let them have it. I'm so they say, okay, I'm not, I'm not ready yet. If you're going to sit as judge, jury and executioner in your conversation, you're really not ready. I say, God, prepare my heart. Because if you're raising concern, if they're in the wrong, you're praying that their heart will be sensitive and that they'll change. And that's not going to happen if you come in with both guns blaring and just let them have it, right? So you say, God, give me the right heart. Give me the right spirit. Remind me of all the things I've done that you've forgiven me for. And let me share with this person at the right time, give me the right way, but give me the right heart that loves, that's tender, that's humble. You'll be amazed at how much healing happens when you walk through this process the right way. So that's the third affirmation. Number four is this. I will share my concerns, uh, I, will sh I will share my concerns with the goal of healing and bringing life. Let's say that together. I will share my concerns with the goal of healing and bringing life. I want to talk with that person not to retaliate, not to make them sorry for what they did, but I want to let them know so that there can be healing in our relationship. I mean, Jesus said the two most important things in all the universe are loving God and loving people. So healed relationships really matter to God. My goal is going to be restoration. My goal is not to, you know, I can find the right time, I can find the right place, I can feel like i got a nice calm spirit. But if my goal is this, they really hurt me and I want them to leave here feeling hurt themselves. Is that really the goal? If your goal is, I want them to just to be so sad that they're such a wicked, evil person, uh, that shouldn't be, the, the goal should be that, that this relationship that's broken, God, will you heal it? Will you restore it? Will you begin to do something in my heart and my life? And then the fifth declaration, and this is important, number five, if I can't do one through four, I will keep my mouth shut and pray a lot. All right, let's try that one together. If you're bold, say this with me. If I can't do one through four, I will keep my mouth shut and pray a lot. I'm not gonna be this person spewing, grumbling, complaining, because that's sin. And when you're talking about somebody else, catch yourself. Say, I got to stop this. This has got to end. You know what's going to happen? You're going to be in the middle of a conversation with somebody. And you're going to find out, you're going to be talking about someone else and you're going to be doing it this week. And you're going to be talking about someone else. And, you're gonna, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit's going to go, that's what we were talking about Sunday, right there. You want a happy new year? This isn't going to help, right? And you're going to realize you're doing it right then. And then you're going to decide to keep on going or to actually stop, maybe in mid-sentence and say, you know what? I, I apologize. I need to stop talking right now. Person goes, why? What do you mean? Just, I was talking about somebody else. I haven't talked to them about it. I'm not, and I just, I apologize right now for what I just said about somebody else. And I need, I'm really working at not doing that. Man, that would be a teachable moment for yourself and for the other people. And you may catch yourself doing that five, ten times this week. But if you catch yourself in the middle of it, stop. And say, God, I want to be this person. Because I understand that, that, that the tongue can be like a fire. The tongue can be like a sword that cuts. But the tongue can also be a source of life. And I'm not going to be a grumbler. I'm not going to be a complainer. I'm not going to be a whiner. When I, when, I, when I need to, I will speak the truth in love with the right person at the right time, with the right, with the right heart, with the right goal in mind, and let God bring restoration. That will lead to a very, very happy new year. But let me tell you something. You don't have the power to do this on your own. 
It's only with Christ in us and his Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Today kind of is an intro to the next four weeks. We're starting a series next, next week called Empowered by His Presence. And we're going to talk for the next four weeks about how do we experience the power of God in us. If you have the power of God and the presence of God in you, you'll be strong enough to do what you need to do. So the next four weeks, here's what we're going to talk about. We don't have to be powerful. Oh, I can do it all myself. I can take care of everything. We're not that powerful. We don't have to be powerless. I can't do anything. I'm a victim. If you know Jesus, you should be every day empowered by his presence, by his strength. And his strength in you will be enough. You want to speak the kind of words you need to speak, it's going to be because the power of Jesus Christ is in you. And if you know him, live in that. And if you don't know him, when you put your faith in him, it'll begin to give you that strength you need to be able to share his love with other people. I want to give you three invitations. And if you look in your bulletin, you'll find this card. It says Empowered Growth Groups. I want to give you three challenges for the next four weeks. And I really want, as, as a pastor, I'm going to challenge you to think about doing all three of these things. Number one is this. Do the daily Bible reading every day for the next four weeks. You'll find the daily, and, and so if you start with, with today's daily, if you look in your bulletin, and I don't have my bulletin. If you look in your bulletin, somebody have a bulletin handy? If you look in your bulletin, there's a daily reading. I thank you so much. There's a daily reading guide. And the first one, it says S-Job 1. S is Sunday. That's today. That's day one. Read first chapter of Job. M, that's Monday, Job 2. If you lose this, it's on our website. All you got to do is click on it for the daily reading. Click on the day, and it'll open up the reading right there on your phone, on your iPad, on your computer. Or you can just see where it is and open up your Bible. I want to challenge you first to do the daily Bible readings every day for the next four weeks. And what will happen is next Sunday when you come and we talk about being empowered through tough times, you'll be read all about it in the Bible. You'll be ready to learn, okay? So do the daily Bible readings. Number two, I want to invite you to do the daily devotional readings. The daily devotional readings are about four pages long. They look at a different character in the Bible. And, and every day for the, for the next four weeks, there's daily devotional readings. And it's, it's in this book, Empowered by His Presence. Uh, I, I almost never do this, and I actually... I, I, it's hard for me to do, but I want, I want to say this. We actually have this on sale here, and, and I'm, it's hard because it's, somebody else, uh, it's not somebody else's book. It's a book I wrote. And so, um, but I want to encourage you to get that, either download it on your iPad. We have it cheaper here than you can get it on Amazon. And, we're actually, and there's no profit line for the church, and there's no profit line for me. I don't get a cut of the action. I don't get money from the bookstore. I just want you to know that because people are like, oh, the pastor's trying to make money. Not the case. The bookstore gives me nothing. Our bookstore actually, our, our cafe and bookstore functions basically at break even so we can make it as cheap as we can for you. So I, anything that's got my name on it, I don't get any money on it. So I want to be clear about that. But if you want to get that book, there's daily devotionals for the next four weeks, looking at different characters of the Bible. And at the end of the week, it's a story about Jesus and how he can bring power into your life. I encourage you to do the daily readings, the Bible readings. And then finally, I want to challenge you to consider getting into a growth group. Maybe you've never done this before. Take this sheet out, and I want to challenge you to either get in a growth group or host a growth group or lead a growth group. I hope we start 30, 40, 50 new growth groups just for these four weeks. It's a four-week commitment, so if you do it, you don't really enjoy it, then you're done after four weeks. But I, it'll be a great way to connect with other people, to learn together. All the video, there's a video lesson in each one that's actually stories about people that are part of Shoreline Church. And then there's uh, the weekly small group discussion questions, which are in the book. So if you have the book, you already have the discussion materials. That is the small group guide, basically. And that's in there. And so get though, you know, become part of a growth group for four weeks. And if you enjoy it, then you can look at getting into a growth group beyond that. But these are just four-week growth groups. And so all you do is you can put on here your information, when you're available, if you're interested, what kind of group you're interested in, the location, times. It's all right here. And on your way out, downstairs here, upstairs there, in the family worship venue and in the cafe, in all those locations, there's going to be a basket. You can put this right there, or you can take it to the table out by the fireplace, and Pastor Zach is there, who leads our growth groups, and just bring it in and say, Pastor Zach, I'd like to lead a growth group. I want to know more about being in a growth group. He'll help you out with that. If you want to get the book, you can go to the cafe or outside the cafe and get the book. But I want to challenge you for the next four weeks. It's a new year. It's a new start. Jump in with both feet. Get into God's word and see how his power can empower you in every area of your life, including empowering you to bring life and healing and hope through your words. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this congregation. Thank you for all you're doing in our lives. Thank you for all you're doing through this church to care for people here, but also in our community and all around the world. Lord, as we look at a new year, we pray use us more, move in us with greater power. And I pray that many people will get involved in growth groups and really start uh, connecting and growing in a fresh new way. 
Now, bless us as we go from here. Use our words to heal, to bless, to restore, to bring your grace to others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.